Hey everybody, welcome to another Monday night live reading with Mr. S. Um, tonight I'm going to be reading from Holes by Lewis Saker. Um, Holes is described on the back cover of this particular version this way. Stanley Yelnats is under a curse. A curse that began with his no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing great great grandfather and has since followed generations of Yelnatses. Now Stanley has been unjustly sent to a boys' detention center, Camp Green Lake, where the boys build character by spending all day, every day, digging holes exactly five feet wide and five feet deep. There is no lake at Camp Green Lake, but there are an awful lot of holes. It doesn't take long for Stanley to realize there's more than character improvement going on at Camp Green Lake. The boys are digging holes because the warden is looking for something. But what could be buried under a dried-up lake? Stanley tries to dig up the truth in this inventive and darkly humorous tale of crime and punishment and redemption. So this book actually came out in 1998. Um, I'm fond of it because of the voice. Well, I mean, it's a great story. Um, it's enjoyable. It is humorous. It reminds me of Kurt Vonnegut. Um, but it's it's an unusual voice for, uh, I think, for the time and also for, I uh, like the 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 readership, I guess, the target audience. Um, but it's very successful. It does does a great job at what it's trying to do. So successful that it won the list of awards here in the front of the book. Um, we'll tell you that lots of people connected with this story it won the Newbery Award, which is, you know, a high enough honor on its own. Also won the National Book Award. It won the Horn Book Award. It was an ALA Best Book for Young Adults, an, also an ALA Notable Book, an ALA Quick Pick, it won the Christopher Award for Juvenile Fiction. This is one of those books, kind of like Watership Down, that can be read on different levels by different age groups. So I'm going to read through. The, some of the chapters are very short, like just a few paragraphs. I'm going to read through. I'm going to try to get through the first six chapters tonight. But first, the price you pay for living in a civilized society. Um, this isn't actually a commercial because I'm not selling anything. Well, I am, but not here. Um, the Good Books Guide. I haven't talked about this for a couple of months because we've been doing a summer hiatus. But we are bringing... Uh, back the book bundle and we'll be doing that next month so if you don't know about this basically it's a catalog of excellent books that you may or may not have heard of with reviews by our team um, kind of short uh, quotes from us from the five readers on our team um, avid readers for why we thought the book was really cool and it's set set it um, it's subdivided into different categories genres um, age groups it's got uh, you know publisher information from from Amazon and my point the point is it's free so if you just go to uh, our website which is clearwaterpress.com slash good books you will see um, something very much like this on my iPad a very cute kid with giant glasses and who doesn't want to look at that I mean of course you want to go there uh, clearwaterpress.com slash good books and you enter your email in there and yes we will send you like five emails but um, they're not like you know spammy emails they are emails that have content in them so I actually have things on uh, uh, literature uh, worldviews and literature there's four email uh, five emails four of them uh, delivering the um, worldviews and literature so lecture series uh, and you also get that you don't get the physical copy you get the digital copy so that's the commercial clearwaterpress.com slash uh, good books and now we're gonna do holes because this is a really fun book and uh, it was popular because of the movie, I think, about 20 years ago, and I'm not sure where it went to if, if kids are still reading it in middle school or high school or whatever, but um, I think you're going to enjoy it whatever age you're at. Um, this is Holes by Louis Sekar, Part 1. You are entering Camp Green Lake. One. There is no lake at Camp Green Lake. There once was a very large lake here, the largest lake in Texas. That was over a hundred years ago. Now it is just a dry, flat wasteland. There used to be a town of Green Lake as well. The town shriveled and dried up along with the lake and the people who lived there. During the summer, the daytime temperature hovers around 95 degrees in the shade, if you can find any shade. There's not much shade in a big, dry lake. The only trees are two old oaks on the eastern edge of the lake. A hammock is stretched between the two trees, and a log cabin stands behind that. The campers are forbidden to lie in the hammock. It belongs to the warden. The warden owns 
the shade. Out on the lake, rattlesnakes and scorpions find shade under rocks and in the holes dug by the campers. Here's a good rule to remember about rattlesnakes and scorpions. If you don't bother them, they won't bother you, usually. Being bitten by a scorpion or even a rattlesnake is not the worst thing that can happen to you. You won't die, usually. Sometimes a camper will try to be bitten by a scorpion or even a small rattlesnake. Then he will get to spend a day or two recovering in his tent instead of having to dig a hole out in the lake. But you don't want to be bitten by a yellow-spotted lizard. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. You will die a slow and painful death. Always. If you get bitten by a yellow-spotted lizard, you might as well go into the shade of the oak trees and lie in the hammock. There is nothing anyone can do to you anymore. 2. The reader is probably asking, why would anyone go to Camp Green Lake? Most campers weren't given a chance. Camp Green Lake is a camp for bad boys. If you take a bad boy and make him dig a hole every day in the hot sun, it will turn him into a good boy. That was what some people thought. Stanley Yelnats was given a choice. The judge said, you may go to jail, or you may go to Camp Green Lake. Stanley was from a poor family. He had never been to camp before. 3. Stanley Yelnats was the only passenger on the bus, not counting the driver or the guard. The guard sat next to the driver with his seat turned around facing Stanley. A rifle lay across his lap. Stanley was sitting about ten rows back, handcuffed to his armrest. His backpack lay on the seat next to him. It contained his toothbrush, toothpaste, and a box of stationery his mother had given him. He'd promised to write to her at least once a week. He looked out the window, although there wasn't much to see, mostly fields of hay and cotton. He was on a long bus ride to nowhere. The bus wasn't air-conditioned, and the hot, heavy air was almost as stifling as the handcuffs. Stanley and his parents had tried to pretend that he was just going away to camp for a while, just like rich kids do. When Stanley was younger, he used to play with stuffed animals and pretend the animals were going to camp. Camp fun and games, he called it. Sometimes he'd have them play soccer with a marble. Other times they'd run an obstacle course or go bungee jumping off a table tied to broken rubber bands. Now Stanley tried to pretend he was going to camp fun and games. Maybe he'd make some friends, he thought. At least he'd get to swim in the lake. He didn't have any friends at home. He was overweight, and the kids at his middle school often teased him about his size. Even his teachers sometimes made cruel comments without realizing it. On his last day of school, his math teacher, Mrs. Bell, taught ratios. As an example, she chose the heaviest kid in the class and the lightest kid in the class and had them weigh themselves. Stanley weighed three times as much as the other boy. Mrs. Bell wrote the ratio on the board, three to one, unaware of how much embarrassment she had caused both of them. Stanley was arrested later that day. He looked at the guard who slumped in his seat and wondered if he had fallen asleep. The guard was wearing sunglasses, so Stanley couldn't see his eyes. Stanley was not a bad kid. He was innocent of the crime for which he was convicted. He'd just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was all because of his no-good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather. He smiled. It was a family joke. Whenever anything went wrong, they always blamed Stanley's no-good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather. Supposedly... He had a great-great-grandfather who had stolen a pig from a one-legged gypsy, and she put a curse on him and all his descendants. Stanley and his parents didn't believe in curses, of course, but whenever anything went wrong, it felt good to be able to blame someone. Things went wrong a lot. They always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He looked out the window at the vast emptiness. He watched the rise and fall of a telephone wire. In his mind, he could hear his father's gruff voice, sent gently singing to him, If only, if only, the woodpecker sighs. The bark on the tree was just a little bit softer. While the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon, If only, if only. It was a song his father used to sing to him. The melody was sweet and sad, but Stanley's favorite part was when his father would howl the word, Moon. The bus hit a small bump, and the guards sat up, instantly alert. Stanley's father 
was an inventor. To be a successful inventor, you need three things. Intelligence, perseverance, and just a little bit of luck. Stanley's father was smart and had a lot of perseverance. Once he started a project, he would work on it for years, often going days without sleep. He just never had any luck. Every time an experiment failed, Stanley could hear him cursing his dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-grandfather. Stanley's father was also named Stanley Yelnats. Stanley's father's full name was Stanley Yelnats III. Our Stanley is Stanley Yelnats IV. Everyone in his family had always liked the fact that Stanley Yelnats was spelled the same frontward and backward, so they kept naming their sons Stanley. Stanley was an only child, as was every other Stanley Yelnats before him. All of them had something else in common. Despite their awful luck, they always remained hopeful. As Stanley's father liked to say, I learn from failure. But perhaps that was part of the curse as well. If Stanley and his father weren't always hopeful, then it wouldn't hurt so much every time their hopes were crushed. Not every Stanley Yelnats has been a failure, Stanley's mother often pointed out whenever Stanley or his father became so discouraged that they actually started to believe in the curse. The first Stanley Yelnats, Stanley's great-grandfather, had made a fortune in the stock market. He couldn't have been unlucky. At such times, she neglected to mention the bad luck that befell the first Stanley Yelnats. He lost his entire fortune when he was moving from New York to California. His stagecoach was robbed by the outlaw Kissin' Kate Barlow. If it weren't for that, Stanley's family would now be living in a mansion on a beach in California. Instead, they were crammed in a tiny apartment that smelled of burning rubber and foot odor. If only, if only. The apartment smelled the way it did because Stanley's father was trying to invent a way to recycle old sneakers. The first person who finds a use for old sneakers, he said, will be a very rich man. It was this latest project that led to Stanley's arrest. The bus ride became increasingly bumpy because the road was no longer paved. Actually, Stanley had been impressed when he first found out that his great-grandfather was robbed by Kissin' Kate Barlow. True, he would have preferred living on the beach in California, but it was still kind of cool to have someone in your family robbed by a famous outlaw. Kate Barlow didn't actually kiss Stanley's great-grandfather. That would have been really cool, but she only kissed the men she killed. Instead, she robbed him and left him stranded in the middle of the desert. He was lucky to have survived, Stanley's mother was quick to point out. The bus was slowing down. The guard grunted as he stretched his arms. Welcome to Camp Green Lake, said the driver. Stanley looked out the dirty window. He couldn't see a lake, and hardly anything was green. 4. Stanley felt somewhat dazed as the guard unlocked his handcuffs and led him off the bus. He'd been on the bus for over eight hours. Be careful, the bus driver said as Stanley walked down the steps. Stanley wasn't sure if the bus driver meant for him to be careful going down the steps or if he was telling him to be careful at Camp Greenlake. Thanks for the ride, he said. His mouth was dry and his throat hurt. He stepped onto the hard, dry dirt. There was a band of sweat around his wrist where the handcuff had been. The land was barren and desolate. He could see a few run-down buildings and some tents. Farther away, there was a cabin beneath two tall trees. Those two trees were the only plant life he could see. There weren't even weeds. The guard led Stanley to a small building. A sign on front said, You are entering Camp Green Lake Juvenile Correctional Facility. Next to it was another sign which declared that it was a violation of the Texas Penal Code to bring guns, explosives, weapons, drugs, or alcohol onto the premises. As Stanley read the sign, he couldn't help but think, well, duh. The guard led Stanley into the building where he felt the welcome, welcome relief of air conditioning. A man was sitting with his feet up on a desk. He turned his head when Stanley and the guard entered, but otherwise didn't move. Even though he was inside, he wore sunglasses and a cowboy hat. He also held a can of soda, and the sight of it made Stanley even more aware of his own thirst. He waited while the bus guard gave the man some papers to sign. That's a lot of sunflower seeds, the bus guard said. Stanley noticed a burlap sack filled with sunflower seeds on the floor next to the desk. I quit smoking last month, said the man in the cowboy hat. 
He had a tattoo of a rattlesnake on his arm, and as he signed his name, the snake's rattle seemed to wiggle. I used to smoke a pack a day. Now I eat a sack of these every week. The guard laughed. There must have been a small refrigerator behind his desk because the man in the cowboy hat produced two more cans of soda. For a second, Stanley hoped that one might be for him, but the man gave one to the guard and said the other was for the driver. Nine hours here and nine hours back, the guard grumbled. What a day. Stanley thought about the long, miserable bus ride and felt a little sorry for the guard and the bus driver. The man in the cowboy hat spit sunflower seed shells into a waste paper basket. Then he walked around the desk to Stanley. My name is Mr. Sir, he said. Whenever you speak to me, you must call me by my name. Is that clear? Stanley hesitated. Uh, yes, Mr. Sir, he said, though he couldn't imagine that was really the man's name. You're not in the Girl Scouts anymore, Mr. Sir said. Stanley had to remove his clothes in front of Mr. Sir, who made sure he wasn't hiding anything. He was then given two sets of clothes and a towel. Each set consisted of a long-sleeve orange jumpsuit, an orange T-shirt, and yellow socks. Stanley wasn't sure if the socks had been yellow originally. He was also given white sneakers, an orange cap, and a canteen made of heavy plastic, which unfortunately was empty. The cap had a piece of cloth sewn on the back of it for neck protection. Stanley got dressed. The clothes smelled like soap. Mr. Sir told him he, would, he should wear one set to work in and one set for relaxation. Laundry was done every three days. On that day, his work clothes would be washed. Then the other set would become his work clothes, and he would get clean clothes to wear while resting. You're to dig one hole each day, including Saturdays and Sundays. Each hole must be five feet deep and five feet across in every direction. Your shovel is your measuring stick. Breakfast is served at 4.30. Stanley must have looked surprised because Mr. Sir went on to explain that they started early to avoid the hottest part of the day. No one is going to babysit you, he added. The longer it takes you to dig, the longer you will be out in the sun. If you dig up anything interesting, you are to report it to me or any other counselor. When you finish, the rest of the day is yours. Stanley nodded to show he understood. This isn't a Girl Scout camp, said Mr. Sir. He checked Stanley's backpack and allowed him to keep it. Then he led Stanley outside into the blazing heat. Take a good look around you, Mr. Sir said. What do you see? Stanley looked out across the vast wasteland. The air seemed thick with heat and dirt. Not much, he said, then hastily added, Mr. Sir? Mr. Sir laughed. You see any guard towers? No. How about an electric fence? No, Mr. Sir. There is no fence at all, is there? No, Mr. Sir. You want to run away? Mr. Sir asked him. Stanley looked back at him, unsure what he meant. If you want to run away, go ahead, start running. I'm not going to stop you. Stanley didn't know what kind of game Mr. Sir was playing. I see you're looking at my gun. Don't worry, I'm not going to shoot you. He tapped his holster. This is for yellow spotted lizards. I wouldn't waste a bullet on you. I'm not going to run away, Stanley said. Good thinking, said Mr. Sir. Nobody runs away from here. We don't need a fence. Know why? Because we got the only water for a hundred miles. You want to run away? You'll be buzzard food in three days. Stanley could see some kids dressed in orange and carrying shovels dragging themselves toward the tents. You thirsty? asked Mr. Sir. Yes, Mr. Sir, Stanley said gratefully. Well, you better get used to it. You're going to be thirsty for the next 18 months. Five. There were six large gray tents, and each one had a black letter on it. A, B, C, D, E, or F. The first five tents were for the campers. The counselors slept in F. Stanley was assigned to D tent. Mr. Pendansky was his counselor. My name is easy to remember, said Mr. Pendansky as he shook hands with Stanley just outside the tent. Three easy words, pen, dance, key. Mr. Sir returned to the office. Mr. Pendansky was younger than Mr. Sir and not nearly as scary looking. The top of his head was shaved so close it was almost bald, but his face was covered in thick, curly black beard. 
His nose was badly sunburned. Mr. Sir isn't really so bad, said Mr. Pendansky. He's just been in a bad mood ever since he quit smoking. The person you've got to worry about is the warden. There's really only one rule at Camp Greenlake. Don't upset the warden. Stanley nodded as if he understood. I want you to know, Stanley, that I respect you, Mr. Pendansky said. I understand you've made some bad mistakes in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But everyone makes mistakes. You may have done some bad things, but that doesn't mean you're a bad kid. Stanley nodded. It seemed pointless to try and tell this counselor that he was innocent. He figured that everyone probably said that. He didn't want Mr. Pendance Key to think he had a bad attitude. I'm going to help you turn your life around, said his counselor. But you're going to have to help, too. Can I count on your help? Yes, sir, Stanley said. Mr. Pendansky said, good, and patted Stanley on his back. Two boys, each carrying a shovel, were coming across the compound. Mr. Pendansky called to them, Rex, Alan, I want you to come say hello to Stanley. He's the newest member of our team. The boys glanced wearily at Stanley. They were dripping with sweat, and their faces were so dirty that it took Stanley a moment to notice that one kid was white and the other black. What happened to Barf Bag? asked the black kid. Lewis is still in the hospital, said Mr. Pendensky. He won't be returning. He told the boys to come shake Stanley's hand and introduce themselves like gentlemen. Hi, the white kid grunted. That's Alan, said Mr. Pendensky. My name's not Alan, the boy said. It's Squid, and that's X-Ray. Hey, said X-Ray. He smiled and shook Stanley's hand. He wore glasses, but they were so dirty that Stanley wondered how he could see out of them. Mr. Pendansky told Alan to go to the rec hall and bring the other boys to meet Stanley. Then he led him inside the tent. There were seven cots, each one less than two feet from the one next to it. Which was Lewis's cot? Mr. Pendansky asked. Barfbag slept here, said X-Ray, kicking at one of the beds. All right, Stanley, that'll be yours, said Mr. Pendansky. Stanley looked at the cot and nodded. He wasn't particularly thrilled about sleeping in the same cot that had been used by somebody named Barfbag. Seven crates were stacked in two piles at one side of the tent. The open end of the crates faced outward. Stanley put his backpack, change of clothes, and towel in what used to be Barf Bag's crate. It was at the bottom of the stack that had three in it. Squid returned with four other boys. The first three were introduced by Mr. Pendansky as Jose, Theodore, and Ricky. They called themselves Magnet, Armpit, and Zigzag. They all have nicknames, explained Mr. Pendensky. However, I prefer to use the names their parents gave them, the names that society will recognize them by when they return to become useful and hardworking members of society. It ain't just a nickname, X-Ray told Mr. Pendensky. He tapped the rim of his glasses. I can see inside you, Mom. You've got a big fat heart. The last boy either didn't have a real name or else he didn't have a nickname. Both Mr. Pendensky and X-Ray called him Zero. You know why his name's Zero? asked Mr. Pendensky. Because there's nothing inside his head. He smiled and playfully shook Zero's shoulder. Zero said nothing. And that's Mom, a boy said. Mr. Pendansky smiled at him. If it makes you feel better to call me Mom, Theodore, go ahead and call me Mom. He turned to Stanley. If you have questions, Theodore will help you. You got that, Theodore? I'm depending on you. Theodore spit a thin line of saliva between his teeth, causing some of the other boys to complain about the need to keep their home sanitary. You were all here, new here once, said Mr. Pendensky, and you all know what it feels like. I'm counting on every one of you to help Stanley. Stanley looked at the ground. Mr. Pendansky left the tent, and soon the other boys began to file out as well, taking their towels and change of clothes with them. Stanley was relieved to be left alone, but he was so thirsty he felt as if he would die if he didn't get something to drink soon. Hey, uh, Theodore, he said, going after him, do you know where I can fill my canteen? Theodore whirled and grabbed Stanley by his collar. My name's not Theodore, he said. It's Armpit. He threw Stanley to the ground. Stanley stared up at him, terrified. There's a water spigot on the wall of the shower stall. Thanks, Armpit, said Stanley. As he watched the boy turn and walk away, he couldn't for the life of him figure out why anyone would want to be called Armpit. In a way, it made him feel better about having to sleep in a cot that had been used by somebody named Barfbag. Maybe it was a term of respect. 
All right, so that is the first the first five chapters of uh, of Holes. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. It, it strikes me every time, it's been a while since I've read this, um, I, I think one of the things he does well in here, I'd forgotten, I'd remembered the voice, but the way he gets across characterization through dialogue without lean, relying on accents. I mean, I added, a, I tried to add a little bit of a accent because of the cowboy hat and the, um, the uh, first guy, Mr. Sir. Um, but the way he gets across what Mr. Pendanski's attitude is through the language of his dialogue and through the way the kids talk to him and the way he talks to them is just really masterful. Um, it's, it's like excellent storytelling and he doesn't call attention to it. He doesn't, the, the kids don't actually process it the way you do as a reader. Um, Stanley doesn't process it for us and tell us what's going on. He's apparently not understanding, but we understand. And so getting information past uh, pass the main character to the reader like that through the reader, even even though it's through the reader's perspective, is a pretty cool technique. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. And um, if, in case you didn't, if you just joined us and you didn't uh, get the URL, I will repeat it for you because I'm nice like that. The Good Books Guide, the digital version, free, clearwaterpress.com slash goodbooks. And uh, next week, I'm going to be reading from um, very different prose from uh, last week when I did uh, The Stainless Steel Rat. I'm going to be doing The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. The Martian Chronicles uh, is a brilliant, brilliant collection of short stories by Ray Bradbury. If you're not a science fiction fan, um, there may be one person's prose that can convince you that some science fiction writers can actually be literary. And um, I guess Kurt Vonnegut could count as that too, but... Um, yeah, The Martian Chronicles is delightful and the prose is wonderful. And so if you're more of a, if that's more your your jam is something that's a little more, um, uh, I don't know if highbrow is the right word because it's science fiction. But but if saying the steel rat wasn't your thing last time, um, don't give up on science fiction altogether. At least give a listen to Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles next Monday. All right, have a good night, everybody, and thanks for watching. <laughs>